grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Chio is one of those places that you are very glad exists, and yet you hope you never have to use it. I'm sure most of you don't know what CHEO is. CHEO is an acronym, and it stands for the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. And Dustin and I were at CHEO not because we wanted to be, but because we needed to be. You see, Dustin, when he was three years old, was much like other three-year-old boys and was in the wrong place at the wrong time. His hand was in the jam of a door when the door was shut. And his screams told us that something was wrong. Trisha dutifully ran up and took him to the local emergency room where they diagnosed him with a broken finger, put a splint on it, and then encouraged us to seek a consultation at CHEO. You know, I honestly don't remember if it was two or three days later, but Dustin and I took the two-hour drive down to Ottawa in order to get his finger looked at. As we arrived at CHEO, they checked us in. They immediately sent us for more x-rays. And then after a short wait, we met for our consultation. The doctor chatted with us for a little bit, looked at his x-rays, and then much to my surprise, told me that she would be doing surgery at 5 o'clock that night. <laughs> Well, I hadn't come ready for a full day excursion to Ottawa. And so Dustin and I tried to pass the time as best we could. We left the hospital and went and found some lunch. We drove around town as much as we could stand. And then we found our way back to the hospital where we were ushered into an exam room. We sat for what seemed like hours racing matchbox cars across the floor. And when that lost its appeal, I started making balloons out of the latex ex exam gloves. <laughs> but eventually the time came. A doctor and a nurse walked in. They talked to us for just a few moments. And then one on either side of him took him hand by hand and walked him down the long hallway. And the image that is forever engraved in my memory is that of Dustin walking down the long, white, sterile hallway and then looking over his left shoulder at his father, who stood there, helpless. I'm sure most of you have had that feeling of helplessness. It's a maddening and frightening feeling. Maybe you've had it as you've sat in a waiting room as a loved one underwent surgery. Maybe you felt that feeling as the ICU nurse told you there was nothing more to be done than to wait and see how your loved one responded to treatment. Maybe you have felt that feeling of helplessness as you sat by the phone, eagerly waiting for news of a loved one who was in the hospital or in danger. However you have experienced it, most of us know that feeling of sheer helplessness. You want to do something. You need to do something. And yet, in truth, you can't. Well, it's that feeling that pervades our gospel reading for today. A feeling of helplessness and almost hopelessness. Our gospel comes from the ninth chapter of Mark, and it's the story of Jesus healing a deaf-mute boy. And it's the boy himself who starts out as the first one in the story who is completely helpless. Now, for the next few weeks in our gospel readings, we're going to be hearing a lot about children. And what you need to understand is that back in the first century, they didn't have our sense of children being innocent. They saw children as helpless. You see, our sense of innocence really doesn't come around until the 1800s in the Victorian age. But if you go back 2,000 years, 
children were seen as completely helpless. In a society where most people spent their days scraping by just enough to eat. And where archaeologists have shown us that the people of that time were by and large malnourished and protein deficient. A child who came into the family was another mouth that needed attention but couldn't help. Children weren't cute and adorable. They were needy and helpless. And so as this boy comes before Jesus, he is not only helpless in terms of his family and his society, he is also helpless because of the demon. We learn from this text that the boy had no ability to cast out the demon at all. The father tells us that the demon would convulse the boy frequently, foaming at the mouth, and the demon would cast the boy into fire and water. This boy had no power in and of himself to get rid of his demon. He was totally and completely helpless. But of course the boy wasn't alone either. The father who brought his son, was helpless. Of course, the father did bring his son first to the disciples and then to Jesus. And so he did do something, much like I had brought Dustin down to Chio. But when push came to shove, the father was helpless in the face of the malady that afflicted his young son. He couldn't cast the demon out. He couldn't beg the demon to leave his boy and come upon himself. In short, the father could do nothing except beg and plead to wait and to watch. The father had the same sense of helplessness that I had there at Chio. But of course, it wasn't just the boy and his father either. The boy is first brought to the disciples. They try to cast out the demon, and they're not able. Now realize, it was just a few chapters earlier in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus had sent out the disciples two by two. He had sent them out to preach the Gospel, to cure the ill, and to cast out the demon. And apparently they had done their job very well. For when they came back and rejoined the Lord, there was no tongue lashing, no words of disappointment or faithlessness. Instead, just a welcome to come and find rest. So apparently the disciples were fairly proficient at this. And yet for some reason, in this case it didn't work. They had tried, I can imagine, not just one, but maybe three or four or six, each of the disciples as they are used to trying to one-up one another, saying, oh, I can do it. And yet they try, and one after another, they fail. The disciples, too, are completely helpless. Everyone, everyone, has tried to help this poor boy. And every single one of them has tried and failed. Except one. It was then that the father brought his son to the Lord. You almost get a sense in the text that this was sort of a last result. Or a last, a last option. It's almost as though everyone else has tried. It is finally time to disturb the teacher. And they do. They bring the boy to Jesus. And with a simple command, Jesus casts out the demon. He commands the demon to be gone. It convulses the boy one last time. He cries out. 
And then the demon leaves. The boy falls to the ground. Everyone thinks he's dead. Maybe he really was. But Jesus takes him by the hand. He rises and Jesus gives the boy back to his father, whole, healthy, and new once again. Where everyone else had tried and failed, where everyone else had done their best and had ended up completely helpless, Jesus tries and succeeds. You know, the truth is, whether we like to admit it or not, we are just like the helpless boy in this story. Of course, most of us don't like to think so. We tend to think of ourselves as independent, as capable and in control. Many of us, probably most of us, especially as we get older, we try to deny the fact that we need any help at all. But the underlying truth is that if you take a good, deep, hard look at your life, the truth is we aren't in control. Certainly there are decisions that we can make. We may choose whom we marry or what car we drive or what job we take and when. But the larger issues of life, the things that truly define us, and make us who we are, those things are completely out of our control. Think about when you are born, who your family is, what genetics gives us to work with, our educational opportunities, our talents, our abilities and aptitudes, what sicknesses we face and when, what surgeries are required, what demons continue to haunt us, and finally, even when we die. All of these are the variables that make us who we are, and every one of them is completely out of our control. Oh, we may try and fight against them. Modern medicine may win a minor victory here and there, but ultimately, time and age, sin and sickness will have its way. And we are completely helpless, like the boy and his father in the story. And yet, there is one person who is not. Many of us, sort of like the father, we tend to come to him as a last resort. We try to fix all of our problems on our own. And only when all else fails do we finally go to him in prayer. But whenever we call upon him, you can rest assured that the Lord and Savior is there for you. The one man, the one and only person who was able to cast out that demon and cure that boy. He is also the only person who has faced all the challenges and temptations of this life and has overcome them all. He faced sin and temptation. He faced pain and suffering. He has faced Satan and all of his demons. He even faced death and the grave. Jesus faced every single one of those challenges. And he overcame them all. And now that same Lord and Savior, he is here for you. He is here to answer every single one of your prayers. He is here to heal you if it is in the Father's will. He is here to overcome the sin and the doubt in your life. And he is here to give you strength for today and tomorrow. You and I, we need not wait to turn to him as a last resort. We need not rely upon ourselves 
and then turn to him when all else fails. But instead, we can turn to him at the very beginning. We can start with Jesus, who has proven over and over and over again that he is able and willing to save us. He has come to rescue the weak and the helpless. He has come to rescue you and me. You know, I've got to admit that even though I wear the collar and get the privilege of standing up here and speaking to you each Sunday, I'm not always the perfect example of this. The truth is I tend to overestimate my abilities and I tend to underestimate my need for help. I like to think of myself as independent and capable. I'm sure most of that comes from my stubborn German roots. But that day at Chio, I was out of my league. I knew Dustin and I needed help. And I remember being in that exam room and Dustin and I praying that the Lord would guide the doctor and the surgeon on his hand. And I remember even more clearly sitting in that waiting room anxious for news and praying that the Lord would help both Dustin and me. My little boy, only three years old, needed help. And I was completely helpless. But I wasn't alone. The Savior was there both to guide the surgeon, to heal Dustin, and to ease and calm my fears. He was there 2,000 years ago to cast out the demon, to heal the sick, to cure the blind, to ease a helpless father's fears. And he is here for you as well today. He is here to help you, to ease your fears, and to give you strength for a better tomorrow. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior.